May I have your attention, please? We're going to call our meeting to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to Appropriation, Compensations, and General Government Subcommittee. Um, that's just a lesson let you know you might be in the wrong place. <laughs> but, but we're going to um, start our agenda at this time. We do have a quorum present. Yes, Mr. Clarice, let's do it to know. Well, members, um, hit the voting electronic system. A quorum is present. The meeting will come to order. The first bill on our queue this afternoon is Delegate Knight, House Bill 51. Yes, ma'am. Uh, House Bill 51 is a situation where we had in Virginia Beach, and it's also happened in Delegate Bulova's district. He's chief co-patron of this bill, so we both have personal situations where this has happened. What happened is we had, a, in my situation, we had a police officer that was disabled. He wanted to keep working, but he was physically disabled and could not work. So he checked about going out under the line of duty statute to see what kind of insurance he had. He was told, as Virginia Beach was administering this program at the time, he was told that you are covered, your wife and all of your children up to age of 26 and any subsequent children that you may have. He subsequently had a child. He was covered for a few years. The child had some issues uh, where it required some insurance. It was fairly expensive. Then when the state took and started to administer this program, the, uh, then the state says we didn't cover subsequent children, so he's kind of left hung out to dry. And <coughs> there's one other thing, but I believe uh, Mr. J, did I have a substitute, sir? Yes, yes. You, there is okay. a substitute. Move substitute. Been motion and properly second that we accept the substitute. All in, yes. All in favor, use the vote and sign aye. aye. Nay opposed. The bill is before us. And Madam Chairman, what I believe the substitute says and makes sure of is now the line of duty act is being administered by the state is very clear verbiage where it wasn't clear before. So what it says was before anybody that was in this limbo period, which we can't find, but maybe a dozen people in the entire state. So we don't know. As these children get to be 26 years of age, or you know, they, they will attrition off. So this, I think, is very minimal as to the budget. And as attrition goes, they will roll off. Madam Chairman, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate Bulova. It's been motioned properly second that we will report with the substitute. You may vote. House Bill 51 reports with the substitute. Five to zero. Clerk may close the roll. Delegate Knight, I believe you have another bill, House Bill 556. Yes, ma'am. This was a by request bill. We had a person that was employed in the city attorney's office of Virginia Beach. He ultimately became the city of Virginia Beach's attorney. He worked there for 30 years and seven months. He was totally fully vested in the VRS system. Then he was appointed a circuit court judge. And he uh, has been a circuit court judge now for a fair amount of years, and this gentleman feels like he has accumulated VRS through his attorney, city attorney, and now he feels like he has accumulated some as a judge. He thinks that when he retires as a judge in a couple of years, that in his mind he won't get the benefits due him. He thinks there ought to be some sort of merge 
to these benefits, and Michael Jay has been working with me on this, he, uh, he knows some of the numbers also. So what the, uh, what the bill says is it would provide him annual retirement not to exceed, uh, I believe it says 78%, unless he becomes a judge of five or more years. It's kind of a, a specific carve out. It only affects uh, probably very few members in the state. Mr. Jay may, may know better than me on the numbers, but the gentleman feels like that almost he's worked for free for the last X amount of years as being a judge, and he would like to get some retirement accounted for those years of service also. Are there any questions from the committee? Madam Chair. Delegate Bulliver. Just a, a quick question for, for counsel in terms of, because I don't, I don't think this just applies to one person, this applies to a class of people. Um, can, can I get an understanding of what the fiscal impact would be in terms of the unfunded liability on VRS? Um, Mrs. Chairman, the unfunded liability would go up by, I believe it was over $100 million, and the fiscal impact would be almost $800,000 a year. What the bill says is that if you were in another, right now, if you just are in JRS, you are capped at 78% of your salary when you retire because you get a service multiplier where basically you get credit for, you work one year, you get two and a half or three and a half years of credit, service credit, depending on when you come on the bench. So you get up to 78 pretty quickly. This bill says that if you worked in another one before then, you can get up to 100% of your AFC when you retire. So it does impact about 70 judges currently, and it, it does have an impact of over $100 million on the unfunded liability. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak in support of the legislation in opposition? Hearing none, the committee. Madam Chair. Yes, Delegate Bullivill. We lay this gently on the table. That has been motion. Is there a second? second? It's been motion and properly second that House Bill 556 be laid on the table. This is a recorded vote. So, so, House Bill 556 is laid on the table with a vote of 6 to 0. The Thank bill reports. Thank you, Delegate Knight. Oh, it reports. That's pretty good. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have told <laughs> it's you. It's laid on the table. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Knight. Madam Chair, if I, if I could, just, just to say uh, thank you to Delegate Knight for carrying House Bill 51. That's not a lot of people, but it means a lot to, to those families that's impacted. Yes, sir. And the parallel, uh, the companion bill passed the Senate subcommittee today, too. Thank you. Thank you. One out of two is not bad. Delegate Rome. Madam Chair, members of the uh, subcommittee, thank you so much for having me today to discuss um, item 57, number two for HB uh, 1392, uh, creating a, a Freedom of Information Act ombudsman. Um, basically, the bill would establish the FOIA ombudsman in the office of the Attorney General. Unlike the FOIA Advisory Council, the ombudsman would be a formal mediator with the power to mediate disputes between FOIA requesters and custodians. The majority of state agencies do not have staff solely dedicated to handling FOIA requests or resolving FOIA disputes. So they have their FOIA officers, but they don't have someone doing that full time. So they're often pulled off from other jobs in order to work on this. So what the FOIA ombudsman would essentially do here is that if you're a requester and you're not getting your documents on time, you have a reason to think that there's a problem, you can then go to the ombudsman for help in terms of setting up a mediation to get that. If you're from a state agency and you're feeling like, hey, there's a request that's not really valid or there's a request coming in, they're, they're asking too much or it doesn't fall within the provision of FOIA, you can go to the ombudsman and you can work this out with them. And so I've introduced this, uh, some form of this bill for the last three years. We've brought down the fisc on this thing from $803,240 the first time to what you have before you today, which is $304,375. So we've brought down the cost on this by about half a million dollars. 
um, in order to make it run. Um, the Attorney General himself supports uh, uh, the, the bill and the budget amendment to go along with this. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any <laughs> questions from the committee? Is there anyone from the audience in support of the legislation? There's some folks on their way, I guess, but we'll see if needed. Any opposition? Madam, Madam Chair, this is a question, and I don't know who could, probably the staff could um, answer for me. So she's asking for a position, but that's the Virginia Freedom of Information <coughs> Advisory Council. What exactly are their duties, and how would it compare to um, a ombudsman um, uh, and that their duties? Uh, Madam Chair, um, I'd be happy to uh, answer the delegate's questions if you wish. Okay, go right ahead. Did you want did the staff? Okay. 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 All right. Um, the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Council um, issues advisory. Uh, advisory opinions related to the Freedom of Information Act and is a resource for state agencies um, as well as local governments. Um, and their advisory um, opinions, you know, are published online and they are a resource. The bill, um, the ombudsman position would be mediating disputes, but it would be within the office of the Attorney General, mm -hmm. not within the Freedom of Act, uh, Information Act Advisory Council. And uh, Madam Chair? Delegate room. The, the, and so, um, Madam Chair, I would just tell Delegate, um, the main reason for this, there's a few different things here. The FOIA Advisory Council cannot issue binding of, uh, opinions, nor do they have the power to mediate uh, mm -hmm. FOIA disputes. And so, by housing this within the executive branch, the first thing that we're doing here is we're making sure that there's not going to be a judicial conflict to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we're giving them actual authority to bring people together in a way that the, that the FOIA Advisory Council simply doesn't have. In 2018, when I first brought this uh, legislation up, the Department of Legislative Services told me that when I was trying to empower the FOIA Advisory Council, for example, to have more, well, just more power in general to be able to do uh, sort of, uh, stuff like this. They told me that would be unconstitutional, that I did not have the ability to do that for an advisory group. The advisory group also only has one executive director um, who does a great job, by the way. I mean, like, no criticism on him. He's, he's fantastic at what he does. But the other uh, issue is that the FOIA Advisory Council only meets sometimes once a quarter or they're supposed to be meeting once a quarter, but sometimes it's like once every half a year that they're actually getting together. And so whereas the FOIA ombudsman and the paralegal working for the FOIA ombudsman here per the request, these are people who, this is their job. This is what they just do every day. And when you're dealing with the vast number of state agencies who you have here, you're having someone here who you know can basically be a resource, be helpful to these state agencies, and then if, you know, a, instance comes where there needs to be mediation, this can help state agencies avoid going to court, which is even more expensive and much more time consuming. And it also, I think, will help FOIA, uh, the FOIA officers as well, considering that they're already very time strapped as it is when they're trying to make room for their FOIA, um, basically for their FOIA officer responsibilities at the same time dealing with the other aspects of their full-time job. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? What is the pleasure of the committee? Madam, Madam Chair. Delegate Bulova. Um I'm gonna uh, explain first and, and then, then make a, a, a motion um, if that's okay with you. And so, uh, Delegate Roman, I've had a chance to, to chat about this and this is actually an area <laughs> that I'm very passionate about as, as well. Um, I, I think with respect to the budget this year, um, there's some consternation with respect to how to fit this in. And I think we also had talked about whether there are other models uh, for, uh, for being able to make this work in tandem with the advisory council. What I don't want to see happen is for this just to be simply laid on the table because I think that that would send the wrong signal. Um, what I would make a motion, Madam Chair, uh, if I could, would be to have this carried over to 2021 under Rule 22. Is there a second? Second. It's been motioned and properly second that we will carry over. 
House Bill 1392 to 2021 session. All in favor say aye. Nay opposed. House Bill 1392 will be carried over to 2021. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, members. Appreciate it. Thank you, Delegate Rome. Continuing on, I see Delegate Bale. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, good afternoon. Good this afternoon. This is House Bill 351. So, you may proceed. Thank you, ma'am. So, um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, House Bill 351 is an effort to address a shortage that we are having in Albemarle County regarding school bus drivers. And since filing the bill and hearing from a lot of your school boards, my understanding is that this is not as unusual a problem as we initially thought. It was just Albemarle. But Albemarle County schools have a 10,000-odd students are always trying to find ways to get them delivered, and they're having trouble finding people willing to drive the school buses. In reviewing options in other areas, they, of course, were aware of the critical shortage list that is compiled by the superintendent of public instruction that includes other places in education contexts where there's a critical shortage. Once identified, it gives them additional options of hiring retired, not just schools, but school personnel for the new jobs. I'd like to, I've got a couple of people from Albemarle that would like to speak briefly to the problem, and then I'm happy to discuss the issue with you further. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Helen Dunn, and I'm here from Albemarle County Public Schools, um, representing the school board. Every year, as Delegate Bell said, we have a really difficult time filling our bus driver slots. So at the end of every year, we have at least four or five slots open that have been budgeted. What that's creating is a, is a problem where bus drivers do double runs. They have hour-long. It's a huge county, as you may know. So hour-long bus routes, students are getting to school late, they're missing important class time hours. We worked with the Virginia Association for Pupil Transportation to do a survey, and we found out that of the responding school divisions, 80% have, uh, have unfilled, unfilled bus driver positions by the end of the year that have been budgeted. Of large school divisions, which means over 200 schools in the division, 100% are, are struggling with these same shortages. So. Uh, for us, this bill would actually resolve the problem in Elmerle County, and for other school divisions, it would resolve the problem as well. Um, in many, it would at least alleviate the problem. So for us, it would make a difference. People don't really realize how important bus drivers are in terms of just keeping our students safe, having responsible drivers, and, and also people who are experienced and know how to handle all those kids on a bus. So this would make a huge difference for us and for, for uh, school divisions all over the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Madam Chair, I wanted to ask Ms. Dunn a question. Ms. Dunn? Sure. Yeah, Ms. Dunn, before you leave, may I ask? Madam Chair. Uh, Quinn. What is the salary of a bus driver, the beginning salary? It's hourly, and it, it varies, but we're at about $10 an hour in the school division. It's going up to, uh, I'm sorry, $11 an hour. So we've been trying to raise that every year. We're getting, we're getting to a higher and higher salary, but th that hasn't been enough. We can't compete with local businesses like um, we right. have Wegmans, we have Whole Foods. They pay really well. There's a local bagel shop that pays, you know, more than we can afford to pay in the school division. And, and Madam Chair, that seemed to, and we can talk about that later, seemed to be one of the bigger issues that, you know, the responsibility is a big responsibility right. to have um, a large number of young people and the liability issues that come along with that. Right, right. Once again, uh, we take the most, the greatest gift, uh, from my personal perspective, that God has given to us and those who are entrusted that we um, entrust them to help take care of our children from early in the morning, one right. way or the, whether it's an educator, counselor, whoever it is, um, we tend to, uh, their wages tend to be, you know, less in comparison to. And so uh, the bigger issue is how do we get to a point that we are actually compensating people for doing such um, such a job that that again could be very difficult sometimes. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Tom Smith with the Superintendent's Association. Uh, this is a statewide problem. It's actually a national problem. Part of the difficulty you look at and why it's so good for retirees is uh, you work some hours in the morning and some hours in the afternoon. So when we have labor uh, shortages, it's very difficult to get somebody that's going to do that part of it. Uh, and so it, this bill would, would help, and we ask you to move it forward. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Jay Deck with the Virginia Education Association, and we also support this bill. This is very important. I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of children are getting to school late, missing classes, a lot of them getting home way late, and then having to try to get in their meal and get their homework done before bedtime. So for all those reasons and all the others said before, we support this bill. Thank you. Is there anybody in opposition to the bill? Members of the committee, do you have any further questions? Delegate Davis. Thank you. Quick question. I, I see the fiscal impacts just two uh, hundred five thousand dollars. And delegate, I don't know if you knew or someone here. The people that do the programming are they already state employees? I don't know the answer to that. This is so a few things. So it's non-general fund, not general fund. So this would be out of VRS, as you know, they're kind of siloed over mm -hmm. here. If you're asking why does it cost $205,000 to do the program, I don't know the answer to that. That was, that was the fist that was attached. Um, and just two things, if I might. The, the, this doesn't say there is a critical need. This simply says they will count and determine it like they do for the other categories. The other categories, if you go on the website this last year, were special ed, elementary education, pre-K through 6, uh, career education, math, science, foreign language, English, and library media. So. They do check to see if there is, in fact, a critical need. And she mentioned 60 minutes. My son's a member of that school. He, it's 90 minutes in the afternoon alone. He's spending an hour in the morning and 90 minutes in the afternoon. So just it, it, the shortage of, shortage of drivers just means they can run fewer routes, which means it takes longer to get through each route. But that's the bill. Are there any further questions? What is the will of the committee? It has been motion and properly second that we report House Bill 351. Members may cast their vote. The bill fails to report with a three to two vote. Oh, passes. There we go. <laughs> I'm just reading this thing all wrong. I'm passes. I'm delighted, but uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> three you. to two. Thank, thank you. you. The bill reports. Thank you. Delegate ask you. Okay, Delegate Sullivan, I got your message. Thank you. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, and Delegate ask you, Delegate Supermanian. I'm sorry to jump in front of you here, but I, I uh, am presenting a bill in a committee that I sit on. This is uh, HB 460, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate the invitation back. You'll recall we discussed this bill um, a week or so ago. I think there is a substitute. Is there a substitute? Yes, there is. It's been motion and properly second that we accept a substitute. <coughs> All in favor, you just vote and sign aye. Nay opposed, motion is carried. Delegate Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the substitute makes a change in the uh, way the payment uh, to Mr. Uh, Scott will be made. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it, but the, the most important reason that I'm back here is that I was asked by um, Madam Chair and other members of the committee to come back and tell you just a little bit more about Mr. Scott, uh, who's the gentleman um, who uh, uh, was wrongfully convicted. So I just let me just take 90 seconds of your time to, to tell you a little bit more about Mr. Scott. I can tell you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, that Mr. Scott was 19 years old when he was arrested, and he has said that the uh, wrongful conviction ruined his life. On a very, very personal level, he had been engaged at the time of his arrest and conviction. 
The conviction, of course, ended his engagement. Heartbreakingly, his mother died before he was cleared by the Supreme Court of Virginia, so she never learned that her son was, in fact, innocent of this crime. He indicated, of course, that that had a profound effect on him uh, when she died. Professionally, he lost the opportunity to enlist in the Navy, as he had planned to do. Uh, and while he did have some good jobs, I'm told, over the years since his release from incar incarceration, he, of course, understandably, uh, is of the view that his conviction significantly limited his, his employment opportunities uh, for the entirety of his life. Uh, he didn't have good health insurance. Uh, he wasn't able to save much money. That, of course, made it difficult for him at this stage of his life now to take care of some serious health issues. The, uh, the RTD did a story on Mr. Scott after he was exonerated, and I'm, I'd be happy to give the, the link to members of the committee, but there was one quote I thought I would read uh, to the members of the committee, Madam Chair. Mr. Scott commented to the RTD, quote, I had everything planned out. I was going to go into the Navy. I was going to get married. I was going to be a dental technologist. I was going to retire from the Navy at 39, and then I was going to go into private practice, and I'd be getting ready to retire again for a second time. But with a conviction like that, things don't work that way. So that's why I'm here before you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, to, under the statute available to us here in Virginia, to get some compensation for Mr. Scott for his wrongful conviction and incarceration. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Is there a second? It's been motionally and properly seconded that we report House Bill 460. The members may cast a vote. House Bill 460 reports with the substitute 5 to 0. Thank you. Thank Madam you, Madam Chair. Chair, and thank you. Special thank you to staff for helping with the. Madam with Chair, the, may, uh, I, may I make a statement in reference to this? Um, <coughs> please, just quickly. I. Um, Mr. Scott's story is is one of great sadness, and it, it truly is one of those painful stories that none of us want to hear. But the reality is that um, these things have happened, and um, I, I don't know if there's any amount of dollars that would be able to compensate Mr. Scott for... Uh, the grave condition situation he found himself in. Um, and I personally, um, whatever formula that exists, I don't think uh, $159,000 is enough to just even attempt to give him back uh, a quality of life that he has lost. Um, all of the opportunities that he would have had um, as a felon, you know, as one who's going into being incarcerated for being convicted of rape. I mean, those kind of things that just sort of uh, just basically disconnect a individual from society. And, um, and I went, you know, personally to try to investigate this a little bit more, talking to the GA's office talking to several attorneys about what else we could do for Mr. Scott. And um, it all went back to the formula that exists that we, you know, have developed the General Assembly uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and I said that if we could do anything for Mr. <coughs> Scott and anyone who would come down the road, and for, for that matter, to those who have, we have used the same formula to call ourselves compensating them uh, for such injustice, that, um, that this is one of the things that we need to put on um, to, to, to make certain that we go back and get some, a group to look at the formula and how do we decide that $159,000 is, um, will compensate Mr. Scott for what he has had to endure. And I am, one, 
I am not going to leave this alone. You know, we have to go on with Mr. Scott and let Mr. Scott go on with his life. But this situation and the formula that's been created is even a, a greater injustice. And I think that we are obligated. And I always say when you have an opportunity to, to do the right thing, then do it. And so I, you know, I don't know what committee looks at this. I don't know how we uh, will move forward. But, but Madam Chair, since we are hearing this before this committee, I, I would hope that you would take some responsibility to begin to research where do we go from here in terms of addressing this in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Rush. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I would like to concur with what my good friend just said. Um, and this, this situation is a little bit different because the, his time of incarceration was uh, short compared to the, the amount of time he's lived since. Mm -hmm. And so we've had these, these other cases where folks have been given larger sums of money because their incarceration was so long. Now, that's obviously tragic and, and, um, and just a, a terrible situation when the justice system uh, didn't get it correct. But in, his, in, in this gentleman's case, he's lived a lifetime, um, it's about 24, 20, 27 years uh, being a, labeled a, uh, a rapist. Mm -hmm. And um, so there has to be a way that we can quantify, not the emotional part, but financially, um, that situation. And, and I would love to work with the delegate um, and the chair, uh, uh, Madam Chair, over, uh, over, the, over the next year to try to come up with something that we could do. Uh, do next year. Thank you, Delegate. And certainly we do take um, your opinions and your recommendation. Um, certainly is something that we can look at over the summer, looking at a, a different kind of formula, because hopefully this won't have to um, come up too often. But still, when someone has suffered so much tragedy and loss of their life, um, this amount of money certainly doesn't heal the pain. But thank you, Delegate Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Delegate Rush, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and count me in. I've, in my time here, I've done too many of these. Thanks. Okay. Continuing with our agenda. Delegate Askew, thank you for your patience. And that's House Bill 783. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, today I have uh, House Bill 783. Um, this bill I have for you today is in honor of our firefighters and other first responders across the Commonwealth uh, that have been dealing with a flawed workman's compensation system for far too long, a system that makes it incredibly difficult for some of our first responders to receive workers' compensation that they rightfully deserve. Uh, during the 2019 General Assembly session, a legislation was introduced to add brain, colon, and testicular cancers to the presumptive statutes, as well as align the cancer presumption process with heart and lung benefits by shifting the burden to the employer. While this legislation saw momentum by adding the three additional cancers, it passed with their reenactment clause and sent to the JLARC um, to do further review. Uh, that study showed and include, um, and concluded in 2019, and it confirmed what our firefighters have been saying uh, all along. Uh, according to the study, the statutory requirement to prove contact with the toxic substance that caused a firefighter's cancer uh, is unreasonably burdensome and possibly counter to legislative intent. Um, in 2019, just last year alone, we lost Captain David Hughes, uh, whose family's here, uh, of Norfolk Fire and Rescue and firefighter and paramedic Heather Callahan uh, of Chesapeake uh, to uh, occupational cancer. Uh, the, time, the time now is to fix um, our working compensation system. Uh, and our firefighters and their families deserve better. Um, so essentially, uh, the bill adds cancers, uh, including colon, brain, and testes to the list of cancers, uh, and are presumed to be an occupational disease covered by the Virginia's Workman Compensation. Uh, these cancers, as I stated before, aren't currently covered, um, and we're looking to uh, add them and uh, add a couple of uh, years and some other um, fixes to the, to the code. Thank you. I believe there is an amendment that needs to be adopted. Second. It's been motioned and probably second that we um, accept the amendment to 783. All in favor, use the vote and sign aye. Aye. Nay opposed. The bill is before you. 
Um, do any members of the committee have any questions? Delegate Bolivar. I would move that we report as amended. Thank you. Do you have anybody here who would like to speak in support of the bill? Yes, Is Madam Chair, I do. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Aaron Rice on behalf of the Virginia Professional Firefighters. We are back again this year, hoping that this is our year that this bill does pass um, and makes its way to the House floor. Today, I'm joined by the family of Captain David Hughes, who gave his life and service to the city of Norfolk and the residents there after 27 years. Um, I will let his widow, who has been here all day patiently waiting to speak on this bill in his honor and memory, and I ask that you vote favorably on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Norma Hughes. <clears throat> Sorry. On August 15th, 2019, our world stopped. My husband, the love of my life, Captain David L. Hughes, Norfolk Fire Rescue, father to Katie Fedorko and Grace Finney, and captain to our Princess Eleanor Fedorko died from occupational cancer. He was 63. He was an amazing man, loved by everyone that knew him or met him. He was a dedicated firefighter for the city of Norfolk for over 28 years. No one would expect to encounter the difficulties we have endured throughout our horrific loss, from simply trying to collect his paychecks for hours he was due on sick leave to trying to get paperwork for his retirement and line of duty death benefits. The amount of questions that we had no one could answer was astounding. The lack of direction and answers we faced from the city of Norfolk and state was not only confusing but often <laughs> wrong. When we become a firefighter, it's not just you, it's your entire family that become a part of this brotherhood. <coughs> Firefighters and their families depend on a level of support and guidance from the city that they dedicate their lives to protect. Captain David Hughes lost his life in the service of the city, and we have found the level of support the city utterly lacking. Lucky for us, Captain Hughes had a long, was a longtime member of IAFF Local 68 Union. Union 68 was not only rallied for Captain David Hughes's cause, but also supported, comforted, and helped our family from the very beginning. From the time David Hughes, Captain David Hughes, was diagnosed to his multiple admissions to the hospitals and sadly, <coughs> ultimately, his death and memorial service. Local 68 provided our family with unending support and guidance when we were in our darkest and most unimaginable situation. The union not only took care of our family, but most importantly for their brother, Captain David Hughes. I'm oh, sorry especially in the way they honored him at his memorial service. We are the lucky ones that had the support, love, and kindness from such an amazing group of people. However, some families may not be so lucky. That is why this Bill 783 is so important for all firefighters and their families. Because once you become a member of the fire department, you will always be the family, and we take care of our own. Thank you, IAFF, and especially Local 68, for having our back. We are the family of Captain David Lee Hughes, Norfolk Fire Rescue. We'll always be eternally grateful. Rest in peace, Captain David Hughes. We love you to the moon and back walking. And we'll miss you to the end of time. Thank you for your consideration in passing House Bill 783 and allowing us to tell our story. Thank you, Mrs. Hughes. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Keith Johnson, the Fire Chief in Loudoun County, where I represent over 600 career fire and rescue personnel, as well as 800 operational volunteers. I'm also here representing the Virginia Fire Chiefs Association as the second vice president and all of our member fire chiefs throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm here to ask your support of House Bill 783 by specifically adding the presumption of uh, compensability for certain diseases to include the cancers of colon, brain and testicular, to the list of cancers that are presumed to be an occupational disease covered by the Workman's Compen Workers' Compensation Act, and remove the requirement to link their cancer 
diagnosis to a specific toxic substance. The process should not require an unattainable standard of proof for the brave men and women who selflessly serve all of our communities. According to the Joint Legislative Audit Review Commission recent study, the statutory requirement to prove contract, contact with a toxic substance that caused a firefighter's cancer is, I quote, <coughs> unreasonably burdensome and possible counter to the legislative intent. This bill is supported by all the major fire and EMS stakeholder organizations from across the Commonwealth of Virginia that have met and taken a position on increased cancer coverage for firefighters throughout Virginia. The issue of improving cancer coverage for firefighters and emergency medical personnel is one of the key legislative priorities for 2020. On a personal note, I am a fourth-generation firefighter. My mentor was my father, Raymond, who succumbed to brain cancer at 56 years old. You see, he was a firefighter all his life, a past chief, county fire commissioner, serving his locality proudly until his death at his very young age. You see, my children never got to know their grandfather because of his long, drawn-out death, his suffering, and my financial hardship to my mom and family. Let's listen to the JLAR committee who stated, according to John Hopkins University Researchers, it is unreasonable to require firefighters to document exposure to carcinogens that cause their particular cancer, because doing so is pretty much difficult or impossible with existing technology and is cost prohibited. Additionally, require a firefighter to identify a single carcinogen that is known to cause his or her type of cancer appears counter to the purpose of, appears counter to the purpose of the presumption which is to relieve firefighters of the need to prove that occupational cause, occupation caused the disease and add colon, brain, and testicular cancers to the list of cancers presumed to be caused by firefighting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, I support uh, Michael and Preveno, Deputy Sheriff in the City of Norfolk and uh, Staff Attorney. Uh, we support uh, the bill on behalf of our brother first responder and ask for consideration in the future. Uh, from an epidemiological standpoint, uh, our deputies statewide, those especially involved in jail or activities, have significant occupational exposure. We have at least two deputies uh, and command staff that have been diagnosed with complex cancers for which there's no genetic footprint in their family. And I ask that in the future uh, there be study to add a broader umbrella to our uh, fellow first responders in specific law enforcement capacities. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak in opposition of the bill? Hearing none, thank you so much, Mrs. Hughes, for coming before this committee uh, with your remarks. And certainly we want to thank your husband and and your, our condolences to him, but thank him for his service to the Commonwealth. At this time, it's been motion and properly second. The members may cast their vote. House Bill 783 reports with the amendment five to zero. The bill reports. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you. Delegate Conver Fowler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my bill, HB 1542, establishes a presumption that hypertension or heart disease causing death or disability of a full-time member of the Enforcement Division of the Department of Motor Vehicles be classified as an occupational disease, making it compens compensable under the Workers' Compensation Act. There are 73, there are only 73, full-time sworn members of the DMV's Enforcement Division. Full-time sworn members currently have disease presumptions for certain cancers, but coverage does not include respiratory diseases, hypertension, heart disease, or certain infectious diseases. These DMV law enforcement officers are exposed to fuel and brake dust and all other risk, other risk factors officers face while actively enforcing the law. This bill would add DMV enforcement officers to the list of public safety employees that are compensated for these conditions under the Workers' Compensation Act. And thank you for your consideration on this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Are there 
Madam Chair, was this a recommendation of JLARC um, study? Yeah. No, this was not a recommendation. As a matter of fact, what the JLARC study found was re related to the hypertension and heart disease presumption. They said that, A, there's currently no time requirement, and we should, the only recommendation they said was we should consider implementing a service requirement for that presumption because it said actually public safety personnel that presumption, there's not strong evidence. There is some studies that show a link between hypertension and heart disease and public safety personnel, and there are some studies that show there's actually a lower incidence rates for those employees. And it said what one thing we should do in that for that presumption is we should actually put in a service requirement. Right now, you don't. There's no service requirement about years of service you have to be before you qualify for it. Delegate McQuinn. Madam Chair, I see the bill that we passed before in terms of the um, <clears throat> fire, firefighters. Um, I think it was 12, and then it had to be five years of service that we reduced, I think. Um, that is correct. That's for the cancer presumption, yes. Right. This is a different, yes. This would be, and this is for basically heart disease. Correct. Okay. Is there, would this be the only, well, no, because the analysis said that there's already uh, other firefighters, state police, local police, um, that would also. This would add give DMV cons con okay, consideration. to the code. Right. These other ones are already in the code. Okay. So is the standard five years or is it, do you, do you know, with the others that we are covering, um, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Delegate McQuinn. Yeah, I'm just asking, what is the... Well, for the cancer one, ours was 12 years, and according to JLOC, that was the highest in the nation. Okay. They said most had five, and they put five in for and the bill we, that was just adopted mm -hmm. by the subcommittee reduced that to five. Okay. This one has no clock service, and what the JLOC study said was, if anything... This one should have a very high service okay. requirement because <clears throat> the incidence of hypertension and heart disease really occur over a long, long period of time. And they said even, as I said, for heart disease and hypertension, some studies showed no link between public safety personnel and those conditions. Some, some, some studies showed a link, some did not. Are there any other questions? Madam Chair, could Del I? Delegate Fowler. Um, I, I would just like to, to point out that we're just asking for parity. We're asking for the same for the DMV enforcement officers to have the same as the Virginia Marine police officers, conservation police officers who are full-time sworn officers um, of the enforcement division of the Department of Game and Inland Fishery, the Capitol Police Officers, Special Agents of the Virginia Alcohol Beverage Control Authority. Just We're just asking for parity for the DMV, the 73 workers across the state. Is there anyone from the audience in support of this legislation? Madam Chair, Sean McGowan of Virginia Police Benevolent Association. This matter was brought forward by the uh, chapter president uh, for, the, uh, for the DMV officers uh, who, who view this as an oversight. Um, they are fully qualified, fully trained, face the same risks as, say, state troopers doing the exact same job. Um, these are not administrative positions. These are frontline law enforcement officers who deserve this coverage, just like the list the delegate read to you of everybody else who's covered. And as an organization and our members, we support it. Is there anyone in opposition to the legislation? Hearing none, what is the will of the committee? If, if, I, if I could, I, I forget the gentleman's name because I, I guess there are, there are two, two moving parts with respect to, the, to what we're trying to do here, one related to the JLARC study, one not necessarily related to the JLARC study. And so I, I, I guess my question is, is would you concur um, that there ought to be some years of service requirement associated with the other categories? And I, and I ask that in all, all earnestness. 
I understand. Um, we have not taken a position on that. Um, I would certainly be, be willing to discuss it with, uh, with the decision makers, but um, I'd rather not take a position on that right now. Um, again, the, this coverage is afforded to all these other officers as, it's, as it is in the code now. We're just trying to bring them in. So if a time limit is something that, that needs to be put in place at some other time, still wouldn't impact our need to get them into this group now. And, and Madam Chair, if I could... Because I think what one affects the affordability of the other and, and so you know perhaps it's an issue where you need to to do both at the same time in order to make them balance off and I guess that's kind of why I was asking the question if, if we could do that one thing does that provide us space in order to be able to expand the number of people who are eligible for for that I understand that and and I, I, my position is we feel this is not that big of a pull. It's, it's a small number of people. Uh, again, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's a discredit to them that they've been left out at this point. Are there any further questions from the committee? Any final words, Ms. Fowler, Delegate Fowler? No, just thank you for your consideration, Madam Chair. What is the will of the committee? Madam, Madam Chair, if, if I could, because I, I don't want the measure to die for a lack of a, of a motion or, or a second, because um, I actually think that there are some things that need to be worked on. And so rather than doing that, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that we carry this over to uh, uh, 2021 under Rule 22, uh, and that way maybe we can get those two moving parts working in, in tandem uh, with respect to the budget. Is there second. a second? Second. It's been motion and probably second that we will carry House Bill 1542 over to 2021. All in favor, you the vote and sign aye. Aye. Nay opposed. House Bill will be carried over. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Superman. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, the bill number is House Bill 480. Madam Chair, uh, this legislation is simple. It's a, um, it allows counties to provide retirement benefits to full-time 911 dispatchers. Uh, it's, it's narrowly tailored to cover only newly hired dispatchers, and, and it gives counties the option. Um, uh, as a, a volunteer firefighter EMT myself, I would say that 911 dispatchers are incredibly important. They make or break a call, and they greatly benefit our emergency response. And communication is so key, and that's what they provide. And um, we we need to make sure that we recruit and retain great dispatchers uh, in the state. And so I have uh, Joel Kite um, from Fauquier County Sheriff's Office who can speak more to that. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for your opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Joelle Kite. I am the communications manager for the Faulkner County Sheriff's Office, and I am the immediate past president for the Virginia chapter of the Association for Public Safety Communications Officials. I have been a public safety telecommunicator for 22 years. I also have a background as a firefight volunteer firefighter, emergency medical technician intermediate. I would like to offer some information from a Project Retains a study that was done by the International Association for Public Safety Communications Officials. This project was done to help communications centers retain communications to public safety telecommunicators. In that study, they sh indicated that there was a national turnover rate of over 90%. Compared to a 10% turnover rate in other government jobs, 15% turnover rate of nurses, 27% turnover in private business, and 45% turnover in just general retail. They also indicated that 66% of the employees reported that better retirement of the sworn personnel was a source of tension in their centers. This is one of the things that we've been trying to work on for a while now and it, working with also the national level with equal opportunity and the inclusion of public safety telecommunicators as first responders, as we are truly the first of the first responders. Would also like to share that Fairfax City 
offers the enhanced retirement to their public safety telecommunicators. I know they're on their own retirement system, but they are a source of loss for us as other telecommunications centers. That we lose our people to them because they offer better retirement and better benefits plans. Maryland has also enacted legislation that recognizes public safety telecommunicators as first responders and is working on offering them enhanced benefits as well. I'd answer any questions that the committee may have for us. I know I have others who would like to speak in support of this bill. I ask that you support this bill and support public safety telecommunicators as first responders. Thank you. Other individuals in support of the bill? Please state your name. Good afternoon. My name is Tommy Tucker, and I'm the director of Chesterfield County uh, Emergency Communications Center. I was appointed to this position last year, and prior to that, I was a, a firefighter and battalion chief for 28 years, mainly with Chesterfield County. Something that all the calls, the thousands of calls that I ran as a firefighter, it all started with a 911 communicator. Just to put this in perspective, as a firefighter in the department, they run 130 calls per day for the entire county. The 911 center answers 108 and uh, 850 calls in that same 24-hour period. Before I could ever do my job as a firefighter, the communicator, com, uh, emergency communicator had to do their job. They had to uh, ascertain what the emergency was, where it was, and send the appropriate resources, give life-saving uh, instruction, stay on a call while, until help arrived. The mental stress and listening to people on having their worst days can be overwhelming and takes a toll on the well-being of communications officers, just as it does as the people in the field. Before taking my current position, I never thought, gave much thought to uh, how the call was received and, and what happened when I responded. Now I understand that these emergency communication, communication professionals are the first and vital component of every emergency response. Uh, without these professionals that I get to re represent now, no fire would be put out, no ambulance would respond to a life-saving emergency, no police officer would be dispatched to a robbery, rape, or shooting. All these communication, communications officers are the public safety and serve the citizens day in and day out. They are the first of the first responders and deserve the same retirement as their brothers and sisters on the other end of the radio. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, a member of the committees, my name is Tracy Zing and I've been with a 911 dispatcher and supervisor for 24 years. I'm here in support of House Bill 480, which provides enhanced retirement benefits for 911 telecommunicators. If you ask around, most people understand that 911 telecommunicators are first responders and an integral part of the entire system that works to save lives. However, our government and retirement programs do not. We are still classified as clerical workers in most systems, and even though we provide life-saving benefits every day. There's statistical proof that citizen CPR saves lives. My colleagues and I are the ones that provide those instructions. We're the ones instructing someone to stay calm during a violent situation, and in most cases, guiding them away from a violent offender <clears throat> and to take state, excuse me, and to stay safety. We're the ones comforting a loved one after a loss and listening to them scream after being faced with the worst situation of their life. We handle someone's worst day over and over and over again, often with only minutes, if not seconds, in between calls. <clears throat> the emotional and physical toll that creates cannot be understood by someone not living it every day. We live the highs of delivering a baby and the lows of listening to someone kill themselves on the other end of the phone. We must react in a moment's notice to save a life and ensure that our police, fire, and EMS units are safe every day. We hold the highest level of responsibility and liability. We are the first of the first responders and should receive enhanced retirement benefits like our partners in blue and red. <coughs> Support of this bill would give the 911 dispatch centers a tool to obtain new professional telecommunicators and allow for retention with a good retirement program in place. We want dispatchers to see this as a career and give us the longevity in the workplace. The time it takes to hire and train a qualified telecommunicator on average is nine months. So we need this bill as a good investment to help attract and retain qualified professionals. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
My name is Denise Crowder. I come from Dinwiddie County. I'm the Director of Emergency Communications. I have about 26 years of experience in the emergency communications field. And over my 26 years, I've seen a lot of changes, everything from technology to liability to the call volume and even the call type. The one thing I did not see over my 26 years is how we look at our 911 dispatchers. We look at them as administrative assistants, secretaries. Um, sometimes we even look at them as female or male transport officers when shifts are low for the sheriff's office. At this time, I'd like to ask for your support and recognizing them as first responders in the House Bill 480. So much has been said, I'll make my comments short. My name is Thomas Nolman, I'm retired from the city of Richmond, uh, 911 center and the police officer for 28 years. And during that time frame, I had opportunity and the privilege of running the 911 center and I found out the level of effort it took to hire somebody that we trusted in the law enforcement field, a polygraphs, background checks, opportunity for us to hire somebody, we would do the hiring blitz because our attrition rate was so high. And when we had over 100 people come one day to test and, and, and have opportunity to test for, for us, we had three applicants that made it through. That's the scope of work and the level of effort is tremendous. When we have somebody that's trustworthy and somebody that can do the job, it takes a tremendous amount of t trust and time to get them to the right place so we can know that they can, we can save our lives and save the lives of the citizens they serve. So thank you. Appreciate your efforts, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Are there any other questions from the committee? Yes, ma'am. nervous because I was not I was not thinking I was going to talk today my name is Debbie Foster I'm with James City County Emergency Communications Center so thank you for the opportunity thank you colleagues for representing us today Whew, um, okay. I have 25 years experience as a 911 communicator very proud of that. I have rose through the ranks and I'm currently a supervisor, been so for many years. I, during one of my first calls, I had an officer that was shot. We need this for many reasons. We need it to, for retention, recruitment and retention, and we need it for our dispatchers. Our calls can go from an officer involved shooting to helping somebody with the fraud call. It can go from high to low in a matter of seconds. It's stressful. We work long hours. We were just recently, a few years ago, put on 12-hour shifts with mandatory overtime and call-ins. It's long days. Sometimes some dispatch centers are working 16 to 20 hours. And do you really want your 911 dispatcher working that long and being on their toes and being ready to help your loved ones? Think about that. Think about it. And please pass this bill. It really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. What is the will of the committee? Madam, Madam Chair, I move to report. Is there a second? Second. It's been mostly and probably second that we report House Bill 480. Members may vote. The bill reports five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Delegate Kilgore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, uh, House Bill uh, 1558, uh, Workers' Compensation uh, Ombudsman Program, and it uh, came out of, uh, it was referred from uh, Commerce and Labor to here. And it sets up an ombudsman program at the uh, Workers' Compensation Commission. Uh, this is uh, uh, came out of the uh, JLARC uh, report that recommended the need for an ombudsman. And uh, so we have a high percentage of injured workers, 40% uh, who attempt to navigate this process uh, uh, without attorneys. 
and this is one way that uh, we could help uh, uh, those pro se litigants uh, get through this process. I think it's, uh, I think the uh, money for this is uh, non-general fund monies that it comes from the uh, uh, Workers' Compensation Commission, but I believe we have to have a approval uh, from uh, the Appropriations uh, Committee and, and approval of the budget uh, for this to move forward. Are there any questions from the committee? <coughs> Hearing no questions from the committee, are there anyone in the audience in support of the legislation? I'm Kathleen Walsh. I'm the head of the advisory committee. The advisory committee is part of the Inn of Court. This is a bipartisan defense and claimants organization. We drafted the bill with the help of the Workers' Compensation Commission. The position is desperately needed because of the percentage of unrepresented claimants and also employers, uninsured employers, who seek the help of the commission. Once it's referred to a hearing, they can't really be helped in any way. So this would really benefit the hearing offices, um, make the litigation more practical for all purposes, and both defense bar and claimants bar have asked um, this bill be passed. And thank you for sponsoring it, Delegate. So much. Yes, my name is Bob Bradshaw. I'm the president and CEO of the Independent Insurance Agents of Virginia. And it is astounding the number of calls we get from consumers with workers' comp questions and many deal with the conflict between the Work Comp Commission and the Bureau of Insurance. And so we, we absolutely applaud this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Kilgore, final words? Uh, no, uh, I, I appreciate your consideration, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and I uh, hope that uh, we get a favorable report. Thank you. Been motion and properly second to report House Bill 1558. Members may vote. The bill, the bill fails to report two to three. Thank you, Delegate Kilgore. House Bill 775. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. I um, first would like to note that I do have uh, a substantial um, amendment to the language and the clerk has that and we'll be passing it out to the committee members okay they already have them yes thank you um, may I, yes, may I have a motion to accept the substitute it's been motion and probably second that we accept the substitute all in favor use the vote and sign aye motion is carried the bill is before you wonderful thank you uh, madam chairman um, HB 775 um, and this would also incorporate uh, the language that you have before, before you, would establish the Virginia uh, plan. This plan would allow employees of private employers who do not have access to retirement plans through their current employer to take part in the said plans through the Commonwealth. I would like to note, uh, after multiple discussions with various agencies, I'm proud to an announce that 529 will <coughs> hopefully take over the My Virginia plan. The amendment language would added would allow 529 to conduct a study on how they can implement this plan. Uh, during the next session, um, they will report back with their findings to the body and will vote the implementation of this bill um, a second and final time, hence the addition of the enactment clause. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank Delegate Torian who carried this bill for the last few sessions. I know his office has overseen multiple discussions on how best to implement this plan. All the work that Delegatorian and his staff did and the stakeholders have done throughout the years will finally pay off. Um, with that, ma'am, uh, Madam Chair, I will turn to you. 
Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate Davis. Thank you. Um, Delegate, I really like this bill. The question I have is I know in years past, and you've got looking at the 529 plan, which is a very conservative rate of return, mm -hmm. and understandably so for the purposes of the 529. Um, VRS, uh, I guess historically, has been a little bit more aggressive and a little bit larger rate of return, uh, probably a little bit closer to traditional retirement account returns. Is there any opportunity to have this, this looked at as both by the 529 and potentially under VRS? I know, I know it's a separate body and independent, but uh, I'm just saying because the rates of return are so different. Yes, go right ahead. This bill has been proposed for the last three, four years. Originally, there were two versions. One was having VRS do it. VRS is so... Their, their mm -hmm. sole obligation is to look yes. at public employees. Yes. This is not a proposal, and, and th there are numerous issues of keeping this separate. Mm -hmm. Treasury had it, but they didn't think it was the best place for them. Yes. This is really just contracting with private mutual fund companies to provide to lower the admin cost. So this is really just purchasing a 401k invest or mutual fund. So you can do this through 529 or through VRS, but really 529 is the best place for it. Um, it's not taking the 529 investment portfolio. Okay. This is 529 working with private companies that do mutual fund investments and getting low admin costs to get the money and get a sort of an economy of scale by getting enough people signing up so that the companies will come and want to do it relatively cheaply on their admin cost. So, so that's what this bill is designed to do. Wonderful. And may I one quick follow up, if I may, Ms. Madam Chairwoman? Delegate Davis. Thank you. Um, and I, and maybe the uh, director to, uh, to you as well. But um, then, would this allow individuals to have a, um, a a catalog of mutual funds to choose from, uh, as well as receive the same tax benefits that one would receive uh, had they gone through their employer with their own retirement accounts, whether it be the 401k or, or other money's invested? Yes, and all of this is uh, particularly voluntary to that employee. So um, the, state and the state and employers are not on the hook for the gains or losses, mm -hmm. just to add to that conversation. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I do, um, when it's appropriate, have a few people who'd like to speak on behalf of the request for study. Right ahead. Stakeholders, I should say. Yes. Um, I have Natalie from AARP. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Natalie Snyder. I'm the State Advocacy Director for AARP Virginia. Um, as you all have been informed, this has been before uh, committee for several years now. Um, and 529 has agreed that they think that they are the best vehicle for this, but they do want to study some additional information to make sure that they are the best vehicle for this. Um, they want to look into what other states have done with these work and save plans. They want to make sure that Virginia employers are actually interested in enrolling in this voluntary retirement plan, um, among other things. So I think we are absolutely in support of it becoming a study with reenactment in 2021 for passage of the bill. Um, so I thank, I thank you for hopefully voting yes on this, and I thank Delegate Ayala and her staff for, for their work on this. Thank you. Ma Delegate McQueen. Madam Chair, and I might need some direction in trying to get this to a place that I think we could go. Uh, and that is maybe first to, I don't know, do we table the bill or do we ask, request that um, the 529, Virginia 529 study be done? Yes. Uh, at the request of the chair, possibly. Or, or what? Okay. All right. I'm just thinking out aloud, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I'm going with it, but... No, you're on the right path. Okay. All right. Yes. At least I'm on the pathway. <laughs> so that... Um, so that... And so I don't know if we table it first. Okay. Yes. So it has to be tabled first. And gently. Then, gently tabled. Madam, Madam no, Chair. No, no, no. Okay. Wait, wait. All right. Well, help, <laughs> help me, Mr. Madam Chair, if, if, if my Parliamentary. understanding of the posture is correct, is that the substitute has a reenactment clause, so it does not go into effect unless we actually readopt the entire legislation. That's correct. Okay. But in the meanwhile, um, 529 has to. agreed to go ahead and yes. study so that when we have this before us next year, 
we'll understand the exact posture. So we would just report the substitute, and that would get us where we need to go. Okay, well, thank you. That's much easier. <laughs> I think she was eventually getting there. Yeah, that's, yes. I really was, yes. Mm -hmm. He said everything I wanted him to say, Mr. Ma Madam Chair. Therefore, um, I guess we're in the right posture to report the substitute, which is a study with a reenactment clause. Okay. Okay. So I, All right. I move to adopt this. Oh. Just one minute. Um, I think we have someone who oh, okay. would like to speak. <clears throat> Thank you again. Uh, Bob Bradshaw, President and CEO of the Independent Insurance Agents, and also working with the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. Uh, to feel kind of blindsided about this is, is uh, uh, subtle. Um, we've reached out to AARP to talk about this plan. We're not entirely sure that this is necessarily needed, especially since AARP <coughs> and NAFA, the big I, all work together on federal legislation uh, for the SECURE Act that would make it easier for small businesses uh, to get together. So we would certainly hope that we would be part of this overall study. Uh, frankly, I'd be surprised in a year's time that some small business groups like uh, the NFIB would come out with their own small business plan that would help uh, businesses and individuals uh, get these plans. Uh, I've brought uh, Jay Denny, who is uh, with NAFA, and this is his job, full-time job, putting together pension plans for small businesses. And just think it would be awesome if uh, the 529 program, AARP, and NAFA could get together. Uh, there's, frankly, uh, the impact statements that it's indeterminable. We would suggest that it's not needed because businesses are already working in this area. And also I would say that it's sadly probably not an affordability issue. It's a savings issue, and people really just need to be convinced that they need to save for the future. But if Jay Denny could uh, address a few minutes. So I'm not saying we're against it. Let's work together on it. But uh, certainly the industry ought to be part of this study. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jay Denny. I uh, live in Henrico. I've been a financial advisor for over 40 years. Um, our organization has identified uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, there is currently in, or there are currently in the tax code, <coughs> at least 12 um, sanctioned retirement programs that are available to individuals as well as uh, to businesses. Um, the SECURE Act, which Bob uh, just mentioned, passed overwhelmingly in the House and the Senate at the end of December, provides a lot of tax incentive for employers to establish new plans beginning in 2020, federal tax uh, credits that come into play. Um, in addition, we've been able to identify through the FINRA um, database that there are within Virginia just under 10,000 people like me who are either Series 6 or Series 7 uh, registered. So there are a lot of folks out there willing to help individuals and businesses, as someone in our organization said, if you came into our office by 11 in the morning, you could have a plan by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And the only other thing I would add, and this is based on my experience, is that the 529 program, very good program, uh, and American Funds, which does the um, uh, investment of those funds, has done a terrific job over the years. But the cost of doing business is not reduced by the so-called buying power of the state. Uh, someone can set up a 529 plan uh, just as inexpensively, or a mutual fund program, just as inexpensively as they can through the, uh, through, the, through the state program. But just things to be thinking about, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mary Morris. I'm the CEO at Virginia 529. And I'm not really speaking for or against. This is clearly a policy decision for the Commonwealth. We have talked with Delegate Iola's staff. We've talked with Delegate Torian over the years, sort of been on the fringes of involved in this, so I've got some familiarity. Um, 
I'm not sure we said that we were willing to take it on. We said we were willing to take on the study for sure. Other states that have adopted programs like this, um, often they're in a treasurer's office, but a treasurer's office that also does 529 and ABLE programs. And so um, I have thought that in Virginia, we at least have some infrastructure and some background, and so it probably makes sense. But the key that we've been interested in is studying it further. Clearly getting involved with all the stakeholders, those who have been opposed and those who have supported it over the years. Um, and so the key to me was whether, and we had talked about whether it was through a second enactment clause or whether it was the bill was carried over with a letter request from the chairman for the study. The language on the study we thought was important. I haven't seen the substitute, so I'm, I, I did understand that it actually put us in there. So I just, I, I haven't talked to my board. My board hasn't heard that. This came up fairly quickly. So, um, you know, we're, we're willing to, to take a look. We don't know that that would be the structure that we would recommend. I know this is set up as an MEP. I'm not sure that that's the right structure. We still want to take a look at what the SECURE Act does. So a lot of questions. It is something that we feel like we have some expertise and that we can help the Commonwealth as they go through the deliberation on whether to offer a program like this. Thank you so much, and I know that we'll, we will appreciate your assistance. Delegate? I just thank the committee for their consideration. I think with all the nuances that you've heard today in testimony that it's appropriate to have a study, and I hope that it'll be the will of the body. May I have a motion? Madam Chair, I would move the substitute. Second. <laughs> The motion improperly second that we would move the substitute. Move to report the substitute. Committee may vote. Thank you. House Bill 775 reports with the substitute four to one. Thank the committee. Um, Delegate Guzman. If I don't, I got three. I'm going to roll it in. I got three to roll into me. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two bills House Bill 587. Go with that one first. If I can present the amendment in the na nature of a substitute. We move the substitute. Second. We don't have a substitute. Madam Chair, there was a sub in the policy committee that an amendment in the policy committee that came up in the bill. Mm -hmm. So um, it's already in. Yeah. It should already be here if okay. it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Madam Chair. Yeah. I, I I can confirm we adopted the sub in general laws before sending it over here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I work on this legislation with the Department of General Services. It was brought up to me by one of my constituents who was visiting one of the state buildings, and he's a single father, and he couldn't find a restroom to change diapers and help his baby. So what uh, we did, the Department of General Services has committed to work and provide uh, changing tables at least uh, for both genders, one of each, and they will be able to absorb the cost. So the updated FISC that I received this morning said that it will not have a fiscal impact. Are there any questions for the committee? Delegate Bulova. Madam Chair, uh, my, my understanding is it has no fiscal impact, and I would move to report House Bill 587. Second. Are there any positions from the audience? Hearing and seeing none, the committee may vote. House Bill 587 reports 5 to 0. Your next bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. The next bill is House Bill 617. And you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill talks about a repetitive mo motion to be covered under the workers' compensation system. 
Uh, currently, Virginia is the only state who does not cover repetitive motion uh, under the workers' compensation. And uh, when we're talking about repetitive motion, we're talking about um, scrubbing a floor, working with vibrating equipment, assembly line work. We had uh, firefighters talking about the many times that they have to move their knees. We had food workers where they work on the cutting meat line or vegetables and how they get hurt in the job and they are not currently covered under the current uh, workers' compensation law. There was a jailer study and the finding from the jailer study, uh, it actually confirms that Virginia is the only state where employers are not obligated to compensate workers for work-related cumulative trauma. They also issue a couple of recommendations, and one of the recommendations is making cumulative trauma injuries determined to be caused by work compensable under the Virginia Workers' Compensation Act. They also said by, they, by doing research from other states, they haven't seen that the workers' compensation costs uh, have gone up for other states that when and uh, cover repetitive motion, Madam Chair. But uh, since the fees that we got, it didn't give us specifics. I am presenting to you, uh, I presented a budget amendment for $100,000 per year. Are there any questions from the committee? All right, there are no questions. Are there anyone in opposition? Madam Chair, thank you. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm John Hurd on behalf of the Virginia Self Insurers Association, that's both public and private uh, employers, and Metis Holdings Inc., which is the, the uh, company that oversees the administration of all workers' comp and liability claims against VACO's risk pool. I've also been asked to speak on behalf of Chris Legault and his clients, his insurance clients. Chris is in the other room testifying on another workers' comp bill right now. This bill is significantly more expensive than just authorizing compensation for a back injury that occurs over a couple of weeks. The uh, statute of limitations provisions on lines 17 through 20 opens up liability for the last employer <coughs> 5, 10, 15, or more years down the road. An employee could retire at age 65 and then receive a diagnosis of degenerative joint disease in his back five years later and would be able to make a claim against his last employer. There's going to be increased litigation with multiple employers defending on the basis that they did not expose the employee to the hazard of repetitive motion if this bill passes. I would point out that other states have seen a dramatic increase in the number of workers' comp claims filed against employers after termination. In California, uh, they did a recent study, and about 40 percent of the cumulative trauma claims that are filed are done so after the employee is terminated. For many years, Virginia law has declared that the condition of carpal tunnel syndrome is not an occupational disease. I was actually in uh, the Majority Leader Dickie Cranwell's office on a Saturday morning about 22 years ago when that law was put on, on the books. Uh, it's because carpal tunnel syndrome has 42 different causes that it's considered an ordinary disease of life. Uh, this bill, by the changes made to, the, to this section's language on lines 55 and 56, will operate to require employers to cover claimants' carpal tunnel syndrome under workers' comp, even if the occupation had nothing to do with the claimant's condition. And that's because it's no longer going to be treated as an ordinary disease of life with the logical and more strenuous burden of proof requirements, that's clear and convincing evidence, <coughs> applying in order to prove it's a result of work activity. We agree with recommendation number 15 in JLARC's report, uh, and we believe that further study and research is warranted uh, in the area of cumulative trauma injury before enacting changes like those proposed in this bill. Compensating cumulative trauma Injuries under workers' comp risks unfairly placing the burden on employers for many injuries suffered by workers 
that naturally occur as people get older because of activities they've engaged in outside the workplace. We would ask that you not report the bill and that you instead take action pursuant to JLARC's recommendation number 15 and have the research work undertaken pursuant to that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the subcommittee, Nicole Riley with NFIB, representing about 6,000 small business owners. Um, workers' compensation um, is one of some, can be one of their most expensive um, costs um, when it comes to employment. Um, and certainly we would hope that you would um, take the approach of studying this, looking at more research, um, not quite understanding some of the JLARC's findings um, that this would not have any type of um, impact on the way of our rates in that regard um, because the same study that Mr. Hurd um, just remarked on did say that claims rates increased by 50 percent since 2008. Now that doesn't, I mean there could be other things that are going on in their workers comp that maybe absorb some of those but for Virginia we have a pretty um, a pretty good system and I think we would see um, our rates increase exponentially especially for those that um, if you are having an a former employee be able to file a, a claim years years after they have worked for you so we would just ask that you would take um, the thoughtful approach and study this and get some re more research on the impact thank you thank you are there any questions from the committee um, madam chair uh, we have uh, someone in support of the bill okay we will hear them now Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is George Krause Mays, President of the Virginia AFL-CIO, and we are in support of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, for con I mean, what, are there somebody? Uh, Aaron Rice, on behalf of the Virginia Professional Firefighters, we also support the legislation and thank the patron for introducing it. Thank you. What is the pleasure of the committee? Madam Chair, just to conclude, I would like to add a few remarks, if possible. Go right ahead. Okay, it's we're the only state that doesn't cover workers' compensation. This is one recommendation, and uh, that what you heard before is nothing new that we heard on full committee, and this bill passed. In, uh, Madam Chair, I'm Madam Chair, I move to report. Is there a second? Been motionally and properly second. The committee will vote. Thank you. The bill reports three to two. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of that committee. You got lucky, Delegate Guzman. <laughs> oh, so, we have lost our. We have lost our quorum. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Yes, we will be at ease.
All right, the meeting is adjourned.